All right, so today we're going to be talking about the Mexican Revolution. So how did the conditions in Latin America lead to a revolution in Mexico? So the first question is why did the Mexican Revolution begin? Now the Mexican Revolution is going to start in 1910 and it's going to end in 1920. So a lot of the issues that lead to the revolution breaking out in Mexico are kind of almost like unfinished issues from when Mexico got its independence. So when it got its independence from Spain, a lot of issues weren't resolved and they kind of come back to the forefront um, in the Mexican Revolution. But first off, Mexico had a relatively unstable government. It was left open to foreign intervention. If you think back to your U.S. history in the Mexican-American War, um, Mexico loses about half of its land. So as a result, there's a large distrust of foreigners and there was a sense of nationalism. And then also one of the weirder things, in my opinion, in, in history, Napoleon III um, invaded because he wanted to, Napoleon III of France, by the way, invaded because he wanted to try to rebuild a North American um, empire. And he put an Austrian archduke on the throne in 1862. Um, that kind of didn't end too well for the Austrian archduke, who actually winds up getting executed uh, by a firing squad. Um, but the guy that was ruling Mexico leading up to the revolution is this man here. His name is Porfino Diaz. Um, he rules Mexico from 1876 until the beginning of the Mexican Revolution in 1910. Um, and this was very much um, a conservative government. It was a centralized government. It was supported by the army. It was supported by foreign capitalists. It was supported by large landowners. I'm very sorry if you can hear my dumb dog barking in the background at people walking down my street. Um, at foreign capitalists, landowners, and then also the Catholic Church. Now, in Mexico at this time, about 20% of the land was owned by Americans. So you have this issue that there is huge inequalities in land wealth, but then 20% of that land is then owned by Americans. And so what happens when the Mexican Revolution starts in 1910 is basically the urban and rural leaders rose up against the dictatorship of Porfirio Diaz. So he was 80 years old, um, and he seemed like he was getting ready to retire. Now, one, when he comes to power, he comes to power on the platform that he is not going to run for re-election, that he's only going to serve one term in office, and then he's going to leave office. But since he winds up governing Mexico from 1876 to 1910, that obviously was an untrue statement, and then he did continually run for re-election, and there was a lot of voter fraud um, that got him elected each time. So people were getting fed up with basically this authoritarian dictatorship that Diaz had set up. Um, he, like I said before, was 80 years old, and he seemed kind of ready to retire. Um, his, his major um, base of support was the... Foreigner, foreign business owners uh, within Mexico, um, and like I said, the, the upper class kind of elite. So um, the what we see during this time period, Mexico was kind of making its money through mining, through oil drilling, through exports of raw materials and agricultural products. Um, and so as a result, like I said, the large landowners prospered but there wasn't any building up of industry. So as a result, the salaries of the workers declined and peasants were doing very poorly. Now in Mexico, we also see huge inequalities between land, uh, land wealth. So about fewer than 200 families in Mexico owned about 25% of the land. Foreign investors, like I said, owned another 20 to 25%. One hacienda, which was like a large farm, was made up of 13 million acres of land. And another hacienda was made up of 11 million acres of land. Some of these land-owning families owned so much land that sections of it was fallow and unused while the peasants were going hungry. So there was, you know, so some of these families literally owned so much land they couldn't possibly use it all. They were so wealthy they didn't even need to plant all this land. And meanwhile, there's people that own no land. Now, as a result of that, we have what's a system that's referred to as the peonage system. You can see the word written there on the, the ball and chain. So essentially what happens is the peasants are forced to rent land from the land barons in order to be able to support themselves. They then, 
they have to pay rent. They also, the only time, place they can like buy materials that they need um, for the farm is from these like stores that are set up on these large haciendas. And so what happens is the peasant who never can make enough money to get by winds up slipping into debt. Once he's in debt to the land baron, he can't leave until he can't leave the land until the debt is paid off. So then he's essentially tied to the land. It's almost like we're back into feudalism. To make matters worse, you know, say the the peasant, the, which would be referred to as the peon, you know, he works and works and works and works, saves and scrimps and scrimps and scrimps, says, okay, I owed you a hundred dollars. Here's the hundred dollars I owe you. Now I'm free. The land baron will be like, oh no, like looking in his books going, that wasn't a hundred dollars you owed me. That was really, you know, that was $150 that you owe me. So there was all sorts of fraud going on that was really just kind of keeping the peasants down. Now, the other issue that comes up in regards to Diaz is there was no system of orderly succession. All the power was in the Diaz's hands with his allies. Um, and there was no succession as to, you know, who would come after Diaz decides to retire. So... It was a very limited proportion of the population that was actually allowed to vote in elections. Diaz makes a decision to run for president again. And this is where the whole thing is going to start to go south. So Diaz decides he's going to run for president. He imprisons his main challenger, a guy named Madero. So Madero was, you know, running for president seemed like he was doing pretty well in the polls. He prisons him, imprisons him. Diaz wins. Now, not only does Diaz win, but it's almost like people are asking each other, like, who'd you vote for? And people are like, oh, I voted for Madero. And people are like, oh, I voted for Madero. And people are like, oh, I voted for Madero. And in the end, Diaz wound up winning by like some huge margin. And everyone's looking at each other going, if we all voted for Madero, how the heck did he win by like, you know, 75% of the vote? Because he's engaging in fraud. So this led to rebellions breaking out against his rule. And so as a result, he is kind of forced to resign and he goes into exile in Paris. While this is happening, different regional leaders began to take power and Mexico pretty much breaks out into a civil war. Um, then what we're going to see is... Um, Kind of give you a little bit of an overview. I'll go into more detail about these things later. But Victoriano Huerta seizes control of Mexico, puts Madero in prison, where Madero is murdered. Um, other groups, Carranza, Pancho Villa, Emiliano Zapata, and Oberon all kind of fight against Huerta. The U.S. gets involved occupying parts of Mexico, and eventually Carranza is going to gain power of Mexico. So that's ultimately what we're going to get to, but we're not going to quite get there yet. So there was a lot of very popular folk leaders during this time period as well, like on the list here, um, Pancho Villa. Pancho Villa lived from 1878 to 1923. Another one was, which is also on the list, Zapata. He lived from 1879 to 1912. So Zapata was a very kind of charismatic, there you can see that's an image of Zapata. Um, he always had this very impressive mustache. You could see another image of him there. So um, Zapata wanted land reform. He was a mestizo, so he kind of represented the Native Americans. Um, he was base of power was in southern Mexico. So he wanted land reform, and he implemented it in the areas that he controlled. Um, in November of 1911, Zapata actually tries to return the land to the Indian pueblos, to the Indian villages. And tens of thousands of um, people began to follow him. And his slogan was... Um, land and liberty, terra y libertad, land and liberty. Um, and he said, and I quote, it's better to die on one's feet than to live on one's knees. Um, so he sees sugar plantations and large haciendas. And then at that point, the revolution became much more radical because you see a lot more people um, beginning to get involved in the revolution um, itself. So that takes us to this question. Did the revolution really help the lives of the people. So like I said, Zapata kind of tried to be the, you know, the man of the, you know, the man of the people. You also had Pancho Villa who was um, centered in the north, who also was kind of like this very charismatic figure um, and seen as kind of like a man of the people as well. There you can see um, an image of Pancho Villa. Um, 
we'll go back to that question. In a we'll go back to him in a second, though. But so, you know, where I, so basically Diaz decides to resign. He's in exile. Madero becomes president, which I had on that slide. There's a coup, and he's assassinated while he's in prison, and that happens in 1913. There's a coup when General Victorano Clerta takes over, um, and he establishes a government very similar to Diaz. He's going to live from 1854 to 1916. He had no support of the people, um, and the U.S. sent troops to kind of show his, their display. We were not happy with Herta coming to power, so we sent troops. He's going to be ousted from power in 1914. General Oberon um, is going to take power. He is going to serve um, also, you know, General Obregón was the one that kind of helped to get rid of Carta. He is going to serve under Carranza, who eventually is going to be, makes himself president. Carranza is going to live um, from 1859 to 1920. But basically what we have is like I had on that slide, we have a civil war. So it's Carranza and Obregón um, kind of fighting against Pancho Villa and Zapata, the two like popular you know, figures. So the, the people of Mexico get involved. This is a famous photograph of Mexican women's, you know, shooting and getting involved in the revolution themselves. Um, Carranza becomes president in 1916. He produces the Mexican constitution of 1917. In this constitution, he promises land reform, um, and restrictions on foreign people's ability to control the economy. Um, he protected workers with a labor code, so he set up a minimum wage, the maximum amount of hours that people could work, accident insurance, pensions, social benefits, and people had the right to organize and to strike. He also placed restrictions on the church and the clergy. Um, so the clergy can't own property or provide education. Also, no foreigner could be a priest or a minister in Mexico, vote, hold office, or criticize the government. Um, at first, not much changed, um, but we do see that about 3 million acres of the land is going to be distributed to peasants. About 10% of the peasants benefited, um, and that was trying to kind of demonstrate the good faith of the, pe of the new state. Um, they also included new, um, like I said, cons cons con blah, new things in the government, so the labor movement, um, and mestizos and indigenous Indians got a place in the government. Um, but while to get all of this, the Mexican Revolution had to be fought. And in this revolution, 1 million people died out of a population in Mexico of 15 million. So that's a pretty large percentage of the population. So it was a large fought battle to be able to get some social justice um, for Mexico. And this is the, the, revolu the, the Constitution of 1917. And this Constitution, though, also set up a strong presidency. And it also established the, the political party called the PRI, or the Party of Institutionalized Revolution. This political party um, is going to rule Mexico up until, I believe, 2000, um, where they're going to be in, you know, in control from the revolution up until 2000. They're going to have political control in Mexico. So to this last question, this is going to be a quick question. How was Mexican culture impacted by the revolution? So... There was very much a backlash against um, European influence and culture on Mexico, and there was this upsurge as a result of the revolution on traditional indigenous culture. Um, and you're going to see that a lot in the paintings that were made during this time period. So that, by the way, is Diego Rivera and our friend Trotsky. Um, but so this is some of the paintings, like big mural paintings kind of became uh, fashion, you know, the, like in, um, in big public buildings. So large scale murals, and in these murals you see, you know, Aztec themes, you see, you know, the pyramids that the Aztecs would have built, you see Aztec figures, so they kind of like re-emphasizing their, what we would call the pre-Columbian past, before the Spanish came in and took over um, Mexico. So you can see another example here, and you can see kind of the, the floating islands, the Chiampas um, in the background of Tenochtitlan. Um, and then this one kind of glorifies the revolution. You could see up in the top, Teradi, Libertad, and that red... Um, banner up towards the top of the painting. Um, oh, oh, sorry, I went the wrong way. And of course, there's uh, Frida Kahlo and workers, kind of the land and liberty again, kind of, there was some element, because you see the hammer and the sickle, which is the symbol of communism or the symbol of the Soviet Union. There was some elements of communism 
in the idea of kind of pushing the foreigners out and the government kind of taking control of some of the land in Mexico. So um, the question is, why was Mexico having difficulty creating a stable government? Why couldn't they create a government that was stable and not have to slip into a revolution like this in 1910? 